there were dozens of headlines about this German uh, fintech wirecard and the missing two billion dollars over the last week or so, uh, and that's obviously put a giant spotlight on the fintech industry. So uh, let's talk about fintech today. Um, every time I think about fintech and how it's changing the landscape in finance uh, in relation to the established financial institutions, I kind of think back to the story that played out in 2000 between Blockbuster and Netflix. Uh, back in 2000, Netflix was not streaming any movies. There was just not enough uh, streaming power. Um, they were just sending those DVDs and Blu-ray discs in, in red envelopes that you <clears throat> kind of kept for a few days and then you send them back. Um, and they were bleeding money left and right. So they were trying to sell themselves to Blockbuster and they've been requesting a meeting with the Blockbuster CEO for months and they were basically being ignored. Um, but eventually Blockbuster sent them a message and said, you guys can come tomorrow at 11.30, which left them less than 12 hours to get to Dallas. So the only way for them to get to Dallas on time for that meeting was to charter a plane for $20,000. And they really didn't have the money at the time, they were bleeding money left and right. But they did charter the plane and they flew to Dallas and then the meeting went on and on. Uh, Netflix was trying to sell them on the fact that they could be running the online business and Blockbuster would be running the stores. Uh, eventually they got to a price and when Netflix asked for $50 million, um, the Blockbuster guys basically laughed them out of the meeting. So fast forward uh, to 2010, Netflix is entering the S&P 500 and Blockbuster is filing for bankruptcy. So talk about karma there. Uh, Blockbuster closed the last shop uh, in 2014 and Netflix today is valued at $200 billion plus. So every time I think about a new industry like, uh, like all these new companies in the fintech industry, in the financial technology, that's kind of changing the way we process payments and we interact with our accounts and finance in general, transferring money, uh, insurance, uh, crowdfunding, uh, all of these areas. I think back to the arrogance that Blockbuster had in 2000 uh, and eventually went bankrupt and Netflix, obviously, we all know where Netflix is today. So today I want to talk about what fintech really means, the various areas in fintech and how fintech is kind of changing our lives, uh, the opportunity to work in fintech and the opportunity to invest in uh, financial technology. All right, let's roll the intro. Welcome back to yet another video. My name is Martin Zeman and today we're going to talk about fintech. So let's define fintech first of all. Uh, fintech in the broadest sense of the definition is any financial technology that typically sits on the back end of financial institutions. But in a more narrow sense of the term, uh, it really refers to all the startups that are disrupting uh, the financial industry landscape from uh, mobile payments, uh, to uh, asset management, to the way we trade stocks, uh, the way we uh, crowdfund uh, projects, uh, the way we insure ourselves. There's a huge power of disruption in this industry and the way we innovate there really is changing the whole landscape of the financial industry. And I think we're going to look back at 2020 and think, uh, number one, what a strange year this was. But number two, we'll think back to all the industries that really changed in, in a course of a year from you know, the way we communicate, the way we go to the office, the way we don't go to the office. Um, and fintech is a huge part of it. Uh, the way we access money and manage our assets um, is, is just part of the, all these changes that we're living through right now. So how is fintech uh, disrupting our day-to-day -day lives? You know, if you think to a few examples, um, traditionally, if you were starting a business, you would go to a traditional investor or a banker and you would get a loan. If you needed to take uh, credit card payments, you had to, you know, buy costly equipment, set up a landline, have a big account with uh, somebody like Visa and uh, the ability to take credit card payments. Today, you can set up a crowdfunding page uh, for a product that you don't have yet, that you haven't started producing, and you can have uh, uh, the ability to take payments and send money internationally at a marginal cost. So there's a huge power of disruption and innovation in the industry there. So why are all of these changes happening right now? You know, traditionally, banks were actually very good at innovating. Um, but in 2008 and 9 with the crisis, they really got slowed down with all the regulation and the fines that they had to pay. And they kind of dropped the innovation ball. And at the same time, we had new technology that came in with the iPhone, the Ubers of this world, WhatsApp, uh, social media. 
And what changed is really how customers and clients um, expect to interact when it comes to money and, and manage their money. And, and the customer experience really uh, is not what the banks are offering anymore. The, the expectations don't really meet what the banks are trying to do. So, uh, you know, when you look at the disparity of the fintech industry, you have so many companies that kind of choose and pick the various areas that traditionally banks were offering as a whole, as a one package. Uh, you're not going to have a you're not going to have a fintech that's going to aspire to becoming a deposit taking institution. But the fintechs typically try to sit at the front end of the customer experience, where the money is, where the access is. They want to control how the customer is coming in the door. And banks, as a result, are kind of becoming a commoditized utility provider uh, uh, with the infrastructure and the back end of all those businesses where the, the fintech are trying to integrate themselves into. There is a lot of opportunity in the fintech industry. Uh, today, 2 billion people worldwide are completely unbanked, meaning they have no access to bank accounts. And so the fintech industry is working hard at allowing these people to connect and be able to start a business, uh, borrow money and, and manage assets or finances. And it's not just a problem for the poor countries. Um, in the United States, 20% uh, of people are completely unbanked as well. And, and a lot of them lived in the Miami or Detroit area, for example. So the, the fintech industry is working hard at changing all of this. So let's talk about the six or seven different areas that fintech touches today when it comes to kind of the different avenues uh, of finance. Um, so number one, uh, the crowdfunding platforms. So you have companies like Kickstarter, Patreon or GoFundMe. Uh, which clearly today uh, allow you the ability to raise money for any projects, for any products, or for um, um, to support somebody, to support victims of natural disasters or violence, for example. Uh, the next one um, would be the, the blockchain and the cryptocurrency industry with exchanges like Coinbase or Gemini, but also services like BlockVerify that help you verify fraud. Number three, the mobile payments, um, you know, Today, the global mobile payment industry is worth about a trillion dollars, and that's companies like Apple Pay or Alibaba. Insurance uh, or insured tech, um, you know, again, allow you to access car insurance, home insurance, data protection, and that's companies like Lemonade or Oscar Health. Uh, Oscar Health today is, is worth about $3.2 billion, so this is not a small fintech company. Um, then we have the robo advising and stock trading apps. So, when it comes to robo-advising, this really uh, is a big area of innovation of uh, a lot of traditional players like Vanguard, uh, where they have algorithm-based um, services that kind of advise you how to adjust your portfolios and your asset management. And then we have the stock trading, which is um, clearly uh, Robinhood um, and more established players, maybe like Interactive Brokers or even Fidelity, Ameritrade or E-Trade. And then finally, uh, the budgeting apps. Uh, you know, traditionally we had to have spreadsheets to manage our expenses and, and income. Uh, but today you have apps like uh, Mint, for example, that allow you to uh, manage your expenses in terms of budgeting tools, saving retirement accounts, and kind of have a, a more overall picture of, uh, of your wealth. You don't have to build a spreadsheet anymore. Uh, uh, you have all these smart apps that allow you to do that today. The last couple of things I want to talk about is, is working for a fintech and investing in fintech. So when it comes to working in the fintech industry, there's, there's clearly a lot of differences um, between you know, working for a traditional investment bank, uh, wealth manager or asset manager, as opposed to working in a fintech. Um, typically, when you go and work for a fintech, um, I'd say there's, there's about three or four kind of pros and, and a, couple of, a couple of cons. Uh, and um, if we're going to list them, I'd say in the fintech, you know, you are actually bringing real change to real people as opposed to being one of the bodies in a big organization. Um, you are in an environment that's uh, a bit more messy, less structured, you likely have less training, uh, but you're not as specialized as you are um, in a typical big organization, which maybe has some downsides as well. And finally, I'd say like any startup, you know, you do things very quickly and you fail very quickly. So that allows you to grow quicker than and you normally grow in a big organization where you have that little specific area of expertise where you sit for sometimes years uh, in a row. Um, plus, one big upside is you don't need a financial degree if you're going to go work for a fintech industry. Um, not always. Um, and then the few downsides, I would say, you know, it's not always fun and exciting. Um, you're creating a new product, you're creating a new system, a new environment. And um, 
uh, that process of creation is sometimes very hard, just like any startup. Uh, it's not always fun. Uh, the second thing I'd say, uh, you know, you're not sitting always in a cool tech office, especially in the beginning. And finally, very often the goals of a fintech or of a company in the fintech industry is to get a license because a lot of these industries need a license because you're touching uh, the financial product uh, area. Um, get to a unicorn status uh, and then get to an IPO. So there's always a rush to to get to the next stage and you very often end up working a lot more hours than you normally would in a typical financial institution. When it comes to investing in the fintech industry, so clearly um, there are ways to invest in the fintech companies uh, in pre-IPO stages. If you are typically well connected and um, uh, we're talking uh, about bigger numbers, uh, but there are ways to invest in the fintech industry um, that's a bit more mature, that's already trading in the stock market. And, um, you know, we could talk about individual companies and some of the companies that I like, for example, Square or PayPal and some of the smaller companies out there as well. But I think the safest kind of way or, or a good way to, to invest, um, again, uh, back to the discussion we had in the beginning about Wirecard and, and the fraud that we have seen there, I think it's just kind of spread your bets. And uh, one, of, one of the elegant ways to invest in the fintech industry is to go for an overall ETF that has uh, more components um, and more companies in it. Um, and um, the favorite ETF that I kind of pick is, is the Finks ETF. If you look at the components there, you have the Square, you have the Intuit, you have the PayPal um, and a bunch of other companies. So I think that's it for, for today about the, the fintech industry. I hope that um, this was useful for you. I'd like to kind of hear what your experience has been with the ability to send money overseas, to manage your money online and, and to kind of use these fintech tools that um, a lot of um, newcomers and also a lot of the traditional players in, in the financial industry are offering today. Uh, I think most of our lives are a lot better than they used to be or than they were 10, 15 years ago without this tech. So I think it's been very useful for most of us. And um, hopefully this was useful. Thanks for listening again. And um, I'll see you in the next video.